every job that I do is unique and that's part of why I like what I do. And so the checklist is also very unique because every, you know, I can make, I can shoot things that are, you know, a 20 minute session with a five minute session with a chef, a headshot, or I can shoot an eight hour event. But the preparation for those things always differ. And what's I think crucial to be, to being a photographer um, is being very malleable, very mobile, very improvisational because things are never going to go your way, no matter what. And it's not, not only being prepared, but just being able to shift gears when you need, because you're not always going to get it your way, but still producing the, the right image or the right images, given what, what you have in front of you. Welcome back to Have a Map, where we talk all things career. I'm your host, Mamadou Njai. Super excited to be back. Um, we took a little break from filming, so I'm happy to get back into this. Uh, starting off, I wanted to introduce our co-host, uh, Aiden, who is a photography intern. So Aiden, would like to introduce yourself real quick? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Aiden Bryant. I'm currently a junior at the Art Institute of Chicago studying photography and film, and I am a photography intern at Dim Events right now. Perfect. A Aiden, where are you located right now? Uh, well, currently, I am on a leave of absence from school because of uh, COVID concerns. So I am at my home in Long Island, New York. Very cool. And our guest for today is Huge Galdones. Huge, uh, can you briefly tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, my name is Huge. I am a commercial food photographer based out of Chicago, Illinois. I shoot everything delicious from burgers, food events, um, cooking demos and the back of the house that really make the, the restaurant world tick. So I do like, anything related to hospitality and food. That's what I photograph. Very cool. And just to kind of just get into it, right? How did you get started in that space? Uh, it's a very convoluted story because it's kind of a second career for me. But um, long story short, I used to cook part time in the kitchen, loved cooking and also love photography. But wasn't really in that in that career path and uh there was a sort of point in my career where i'm like all right i can connect these two i can correct connect my love for food and my love for photography and do it full time and that's that was probably 12 years ago and from there i'm just living the american dream doing it every day that's so dope i feel like that's one of the things that you know there's so much opportunity that you can kind of just go where your passions align right um, and one thing that I, I always love to know is where did that passion start for you with photography, right? What is like maybe some of the earliest moments you had? Um, a, a lot of, a lot of my buddies mess with me about it because I used to be an avid paintballer. So I, I used to be a, a competitive paintballer. And one day I'm like, I'm going to sell all my gear, you know, thousands of dollars worth of gear. And I bought myself my first SLR. This was probably 2000, 2001. And I just wanted to pick it up. I was a hobbyist. I just started um, shooting for the school newspaper, just sh shooting flowers at the park, shooting people on the street, just whatever I could to sort of figure out, is this for me? Um, I don't consider myself a perfectionist, but I, I do consider myself a, a technician and sort of a, a scientist of sorts. So um, when I got the camera in my hand, the goal for me was just to be as good as I could be. And I started interning with the different photographers and learning the tricks of the trade. And uh, that's sort of how it all started. It was just, you know, a, a, rand a, random, a, a random artistic query I wanted to sort of explore. And when do you think you had that moment that made you want to take it more from a, a query you wanted to explore to more of a career path? Um, so when I was working um, at the restaurant, um, I'm from Montreal originally, so I was working this, uh, at that time, a very, a very excellent restaurant, but not really well known. And I was shooting with my camera, you know, stuff behind the scenes, just randomly, just like, hey, I'll, I'll shoot, you know, you guys cooking or I'll, I'll shoot the food. And then, you know, a couple of weeks go by and the owner is like, hey, Food and Wine Magazine, Elle Magazine, Forbes Magazine wants some pictures. Can we use your pictures? And this was all before I was thinking about compensation or licensing or all these type of things. It was just more like, hey, these images are going to end up in this, in this print magazine. And that's when I realized I could be doing this for the rest of my life. 
I feel like that's so interesting. So like, you kind of just got thrown right into it right away. Like getting your first works published. How did that like feel in that timing? Um, it, it, I mean, I don't want to sound vain, but you know, it felt pretty awesome. And that's really what the trigger was to be like, all right, this is something I can really do. You know, I don't want to work in the kitchen until two or three in the morning. Um, I want to still be a part of the industry, be part of this restaurant uh, fraternity or, 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 you know, just this family, but, you know, still have control over my schedule, have control over what I can create. And again, not, and work for myself. And that's sort of how, it, you know, it, I ended up doing what I do. Yeah, I feel like the skill set for you, I feel like that gives you such an advantage, right? Because you already know your way around the kitchen, right? So when we talk about skills, and we always talk about it in the internship program, right? I always say all you have is all you need, right? So you take your specific lens of life and you apply that to um, whatever career field you're trying to go into, right? So can you talk about how that skill set has kind of maybe put you ahead of some of the you know, the competition or other people that shoot in that space? Well, one million percent agree with you. And I think that's why I've been as successful as I have been, is that I understand the language of, of the restaurant. I understand the movement, the dance in the kitchen. And so when I have clients coming up to me and saying, hey, we want to hire you to do this or to do that for a restaurant, you know, my, my technical prowess with respect to you know, what food should taste like, what it should look like, I think really does apply. And the fact that I can talk to a chef and say, hey, we got to do this, this, and this. I know you don't have all the time in the world. I'm not going to spend eight hours shooting one burger. You know, time is money. I know that they have things to do, other things to do, more important things to do. But I can also find the most efficient way to get the job done. And um, in having worked in the kitchen, I'm able to communicate with these clients in the, in the most efficient way possible. Yeah, I was actually, when I was looking at your work, when they sent over your website, I, I really felt a level of like a personal feeling, like you had a very great connection with your subjects. And I wanted to ask, when you're shooting all the different areas, uh, do you approach certain ones differently or would you say you have a, a general approach to how you shoot your stuff? Um, uh, can you specify areas? What do you mean by areas? Oh yeah. So I mean, like you know, portraits versus food versus back at yeah. house or? Yeah, front of house, back of house, when you're shooting the oh, food. Yeah. Every sure. So um, let's say I'm doing portraits, for instance. I think that's one of the hardest things to do when I'm shooting um, in the restaurant space is because these chefs or these cooks aren't models. So it's finding a certain rhythm, a certain connection that allows me to get the expression that I want them to, to convey. So, um, you know, again, not working with models, they're just trying to make it comfortable. And sometimes that's just, you know, swearing like a sailor. Or, or dropping F-bombs or, you know, just, again, just finding ways to sort of have them crack. Um, when it comes to the food, again, it's, I'm, I'm shooting something that's not talking back to me. So it's, again, with my food knowledge, knowing how things should look, knowing what angle works best. I, I always use this example, I would never shoot a burger from above because you would never get all the different layers that make a burger sing. Um, when I'm shooting events, I, I like to be a fly on the wall. Even though I'm, you know, I'm a 250 pound Asian dude, bald guy, I can still be in the corner and capture the moments as they happen when I'm shooting a food event or I'm shooting chef in the kitchen. The last thing I want to be is in the way. And so it's just capturing those moments as they occur and trying not to force them. So um, yeah, there are many different techniques to get the right shot. It really depends on what, what I'm shooting. Uh, I think that's super important. And uh, you touched on it a little bit, but what does the uh, preparation look like, right? Because I think that's something that we've been talking about um, really on like a day-to-day -day basis. When you're going to these shoots, right? How are you preparing for some of these? Maybe, you know, I know for our interns and a lot of people who are listening to this podcast, they might be newer to this new approach, right? So maybe they haven't shot foods before. Maybe they haven't shot an event. So how do you prepare for that? Yeah, so I mean, you know, it's sort of apples and oranges. It really depends on what I'm shooting. Let's say I'm shooting an editorial for a magazine. Sometimes I have to go to the restaurant. I only have 20 minutes with the chef. So it's sort of in my head, scouting and preparing the equipment that I need to get that one or two shots immediately right away in that span of 20 minutes. 
Um, when I'm shooting an event, it really depends on the scope of the event. How many people? What's the lighting? You know, the, there are many things that go into preparing. Um, stupid things is what's the dress code? You know, those are all things that I have to take into account. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's every, every job that I do is unique. And that's part of why I like what I do. And so the checklist is also very unique because every, you know, I can make, I can shoot things that are, you know, a 20 minute session with a five minute session with a chef, a headshot, or I can shoot an eight hour event. But the preparation for those things always differ. And what's, I think, crucial to be to being a photographer um, is being very malleable, very mobile, very improvisational, because things are never going to go your way, no matter what. And it's not, not only being prepared, but just being able to shift gears when you need, because you're not always going to get it your way, but still producing the, the right image or the right images, given what, what you have in front of you. It's, it's, there's no real formula uh, other than be, expect the unexpected. That's probably the best way, expect the unexpected. And just have the right tools in your arsenal and the right skill set and also the right team to make things go your way. Because yeah, yes, even though it's my company and even though you know, I shoot 95% of what I do, I lean on a, a huge team of, of creatives, um, food stylists, um, digital techs, assistants, gaff, you know, gaffers to help make the, make the magic happen. So it's tr trust, trusting others as well to, to, to get it done. And I think what you talked about, and, and you're making 100% sense, right? I like for these points to be right there so people have a, a realistic expectation of what it's like to go into this career, right? Mm -hmm. So in talking about working in the team, right, I know there can be a lot of different communication styles, right? Um, how have you learned to navigate communicating with different creatives and different career, career fields? Um, let's, let's, let's put it this way for, for my team of, um, creatives. So the, the stylists, digital techs, um, assistants, what have you interns. Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty frank. I'm pretty straightforward. I, I don't think I, I massage the situation. I think I sort of fluff things up. You know, it is what it is in my brain. I sort of know what I need to get done or what needs to get done. And we, tr we as a team try and cohesively solve that problem. I'm not telling people exactly what, the, what they have to do, but um, I, 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 I definitely am honest when I tell them when I need their help. That, I think that's a big thing. When it comes to talking to clients, that's a different thing because every client is very moody, very different. And so sometimes it takes that, that salesmanship that I, know, I never really trained to do um, you know, sort of have to finesse your way around communicating with agents or with art directors or with age, you know, um, with, with, with those, the, the more con commercial creative types. So it's, uh, you know, it's more of a dance I find when you're talking with the client, with my team, it's really, and not that I'm not being honest with the, with the clients, it's just with my team, I can be more, again, more frank and just more terse. And they don't think of me as being a, a douche or, or a dick. It's just me being honest and me at the end of the day, my job is to make images A, B, and C for client A. And we're going to, we're going to get that done. However, it needs to get done given budgets and when, you know, all those, you know, little, I'm sure you're aware of budgets make a big thing or little things. So. Yeah. They can, they can definitely make a huge difference. So, in talking about all of these um, different, you know, projects, you know, sometimes you have a short amount of time, sometimes you have a longer amount of time. Um, that can be a stressful situation, right? So, in speaking on that, what does this idea of self-care look like for you, right? Because I feel like as creatives, you always need time to recharge and recalibrate. Um, and everybody's self-care routine looks a little different and some people are growing in that space. So for you, what does self-care one maybe mean? And then what does that look like? Um, well, self-care for me, what, what it actually means is um, carving out time for myself that doesn't necessarily involve, you know, all the menial and all the 
you know, everything that you deal with as a business owner, you know, it's, it's my way to sort of release. So whether that's spending time with family or, or cooking for myself, those are ways that I sort of, um, sort of reset my Zen. But uh, we were actually connected via a mutual friend, Steve Smith, who I golf with a, a, an absurd amount of time. And golf, has, <laughs> and golf had really has been my sort of, um, my, my, my recharge. And obviously with, with COVID currently, you know, a lot of the restaurants, a lot of my clients have been either furloughed or, are, or have been struggling um, so business hasn't been as busy as it was pre COVID. I don't, I don't know if it'll ever get back to where it's been, but, um, I'm just taking some personal time and golfing, spending time with, you know, good people. So that way I remain a good person and not grumpy old fart. Who's, you know, upset about the current, you know, situation. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I saw in the, the thing I was given about you before we did the interview that you were trying to take your company to do something with the struggling restaurant industry. Um, I was just curious as to what measures you were trying to take with that. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a very deep question. Um, I, I just feel like the service industry um, has changed, you know, with everyone on these PPP loans, budgets are tighter, staffs are smaller, um, menus have been truncated, um, you know, so I'm, I'm not able to provide the same services I have been in the past um, for the same mar like margins or, or profit margins, have you. So um, luckily, a lot of my clients have been customers of mine for, and friends for, for many years. So trying to find, you know, um, package deals or uh, trying to work with their restructuring or how they've restructured their businesses and restaurants and me providing um, said services for, you know, less of a fee or for shorter time spans. Um, you know, that's really the name of the game. It's just adapting with, with the, the economy. Um, and so it has been a lot of um, just trying to not cut corners is the wrong word. It's trying, it's trying more to provide the best bang for the buck given what's out there right now. Uh, and, you know, as someone who's been in the business for many years and who's accustomed to, let's say, a certain price point per hour for my time and, you know, for my product, having to, you know, realistically say, yes, I realize that, that my time might be worth so-and-so, but everyone can't afford so-and-so. Um, so we need to really figure out where the happy medium is, where I can still operate a business, you know, but also make sure that my clients and my friends who I've, you know, grown to work with over the years remain happy and can use the services um, in this, in this, um, during this pandemic. And I'm sure um, Mo, th that must be the same for you and with events, like with, with events happening or not happening, you, you sort of have to sort of sh shift, uh, shift the system. Am, am I mistaken or? No, that's a hundred percent. I was just going to talk about that, but yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things what I was what comes to my mind is grace and humility right um, and I think that is something that especially in experiential marketing I feel like it's a lot it's very flashy right and then this industry can be very flashy and a lot of egos can be thrown around and um, I think that's one of the things that has to kind of like die right now right um, to really help the industry as a whole right rather than just worrying about your specific self in this moment. Correct. Um, and I think that's something that I'm so interested in. And obviously we don't even know what this is gonna look like, right? Because when it first started, I was like, oh, this is just gonna be to August and then we'll figure it out. But now it's becoming the norm. So it, it's really about how can we as a team effort work together to get whatever your business is doing, help it grow so we all can grow together rather than looking at, at an individual viewpoint. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, prior to COVID, um, event photography, food event photography, like the James Beard Awards, Food and Wine Magazine, their Aspen Classic, you know, that comprised about 30% of my income. And to see all of that, you know, wash away, you know, to say the least, um, has been tough. But, you know, we're, we're, I think we'll all get through it and just being there for everyone and, and just making sure that people know that I'm still there to help them um, is... I, th I think means means more than 
than, than anything. Just, you know, because I'd want my clients, if I needed something that for, for them to be there for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the one thing I think, you know, with business, until you get into it, you don't really know that, right? You think of business as this thing where it's just like, I need this money and this is what I need and this is just how I operate. But these people become your friends, right? Like, so at the end of the day, you don't want to see them struggle and they don't want to see you struggle. So it becomes a, a very cohesive ecosystem that helps to build one another up. It's just all about kind of getting in there and showcasing the good work that you are doing and, and just being reliable in, the, in that time as well. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, again, I'm just getting back to what we talked about, you know, what makes my business successful other, other than um, the, um, other than me being having experience in the kitchen, it really is just fostering relationships. So anyone that works with me, um, th there's always th the big thing I always try and hammer in is that it's all about fostering relationships. It's about it's about creating a community and a family that um, that e where everyone can feel equal and can create and can do so without shame and um, in good times and in bad, you know. Yeah. And oh, you know, and then that's what, and that's why a lot of my clients have been repeat clients because you know when you create these relationships, you know you you, you never want to break up. You know, if you're good, if you want to work with good people and you're a good person, it's, it's always going to, it's always going to work out. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's always going to come back. Yeah. I agree with that. I'm just trying to be positive. You're just trying to stay positive in this time, but that's, it's always been my mantra. It really has. So talking about clients, what advice would you give for someone, you know, when you moved in from photography being a more individualistic pursuit to working for clients and having to deal with other people's ideas, um, what would you, what advice would you give to someone making the transition into that field? From um, being like a, a a freelancer to sort of working with bigger clients, is that what the question is? Or well, I guess more so photography being something that you do, like you said, you're taking pictures just for yourself, but now you have to deal with working for a client, working with someone else's vision. I mean, what would you, what advice would you give for moving into that field? Um, it's listen as much as you can. You know, every client's going to be different. Every client is going to want something different. Um, but also understanding that, you know, if you're in the business long enough, people are going to hire you because they know you can execute a certain vision. So it's, yeah, yes, so, so it's, yes, every client's going to have a different vision and you have to sort of work around that. But also trust in yourself that you can, they're hiring you because they know you can do it for your own vision as well. So it's, it's not about ego. It's just more about um, skill set and just about why they're hiring you, you know, like make sure that, that you, that you know, inside that they're hiring me because they know I can do it. So we're going to crush it. Not, and, and don't get steamrolled or not that you would get steamrolled or that they'd be very um, aggressive in terms of how their vision is, but, by listening, uh, by listening as much as you can, you you guys will get to a, a happy medium where everyone will get what they want, and you and you won't have to compromise your art your artistic prowess or your artistic skill. Oh, that's great advice, and I think you know to kind of end it on a lighter note, right? Um, we always love to talk about music, right? I feel like music makes the world go round and round, as someone might say. Uh, but for you, maybe when you're editing or maybe when you're preparing for your day, what are, what are you listening to? I'm pre preparing for my day. If, if, I'm, if I'm shooting, let's say I'm preparing for a big event or I'm shooting, it's, it's always like 90s R&B. That's what I grew up with. You know, so I'm going to go old school, you know, go Usher. I'll even go What's on Voice to Men, mm. so, you know, stuff like that. But, um, like, <sighs> this is really strange, but two years ago, I was in Nashville for, um, like, a bachelor party, and they surprised me with some tickets to Garth Brooks. I was never, I was never a country guy, ever. I, I saw Garth Brooks live, and I'm just like, holy shit, he's like the country Michael Jackson. Everyone in this... <laughs> auditorium or in the stadium 
is singing every word. I didn't know any, anything about Gosh Brooks other than, you know, a couple of songs. And just this whole crowd is just enamored by Garth Brooks. And ever since then, I've just been trying to figure out, you know, the, the whole country genre for me. So, you know, I'll, I'll rock country in the, uh, in the car. I, I like that. Country is definitely, there's a lot of evolution in country now, but like Garth Brooks, I remember Garth Brooks all the time. My aunt is the only one in our family who listens to country music and that would always be would either be Garth Brooks or I think Tim McGraw um, would be her her kind of favorite. Yeah, artist. I mean, I you know I, I can't even tell you all the other artists. You know, maybe Casey Musgraves, but I, you know, mm. it's just I like I, Casey I, I, yeah, you know. Um, but I like what I like, and to be honest with you, I'm also a big Broadway head, so I listen to a lot of musicals. Um, but again, Down and Dirty for me is like '90s R and B. And then obviously you got Steve Smith hooking me up with some fancy Hagood stuff and all, hey. these, new, all these new trendy things that I never knew about, you know, so, which I, I love to listen to. Although, you know, Leon Bridges is equally amazing. So Yeah. No, Leon is a, uh, fancy yeah. is great. And Leon, Leon is definitely an amazing talent. So, yeah. That. Yeah. And that's like a good mix, of, a good mix of everything for me. But, you know, um, I, I don't discriminate, you know, maybe the only thing I don't, technically like to listen to um is it's like op operatic ballads and stuff like that mm. but other, other than that I'm, I'm i'm pretty easy i'm pretty mm. easy and you know i've seen my fair share of concerts but uh yeah i don't I, I, anything makes me happy i love that i love that well i just want to thank you so much huge for being on the podcast and sharing so much knowledge um i think this one you shared a lot of good information about the technicalities of the work that you do, right? And I think that's really why for us, Have a Map is around so people can figure out the direction that they're trying to go into when it stems to the careers that they're interested in. So um, at the end of our programs, you always like to give the person a round of applause and thank you so much <laughs> for uh, everything that you've done. And this makes such a difference um, to the different interns that we work with and then people applying for our internship and college students. So we truly want to thank you for that. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. And if there's any other questions down the line or if anybody wants to contact me, I don't know if you share this in the, in, in the notes or whatever, but I'm, I'm happy to field questions. If anybody's looking for an internship too within my studio, um, you know, or if you, you know, these are all open-ended uh, invitations to sort of chat or, you know, I'm always happy to help the younger generation, y younger. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. Yeah, I love it. Great, great conversation. And thank you all for listening to Have a Map. Um, we will be back next Saturday with the next episode. Have a great evening, day, morning, whatever it might be for you. All right, bye.